Hey, what's up everybody? Remy Sovereign here from RemySovereign.com. In today's video, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to be doing a little online lecture, kind of slash presentation for you. And, and it's going to be about exercises to avoid for a disc bulge or herniation. And so, you know, a lot of my subscribers lately have been asking me what exercises to avoid and asking me to do a video. So I figured this would be something that would be a little bit different and something where I can kind of teach everybody some exercises to avoid. If you're someone that has a disc bulge or disc herniation and in terms of what exercises may be optimal and what exercises are not optimal. So to begin, what we're going to be covering today is low, some low back injury statistics we'll start with, some factors affecting low back injuries, we'll look at exercises to avoid for a posterior and or lateral disc bulge or herniation, look at exercises that may cause a disc bulge or herniation, look at some high risk or dangerous exercises, look at exercises that are commonly performed with bad form or bad technique that may create some sort of herniation or bulging mechanism, and we'll talk about how sitting or any sort of, sort of seated exercises are not very functional and not very practical. So to begin with some statistics, so Meidel and, and colleagues found that about 25, uh, in 1999 they did some research and about 27% of all injuries in the US private industry involved the back as the injured body part. So it's over a quarter of all injuries in the US private injury involved the back. So overexertion and lifting caused the most number of injuries to the back. I was about 63% in 1995, including the spine and spinal column in the lumbar region of the back. So nearly 65% in 1995. So most low or most back injuries occurred in the lumbar region, which is important to note. And so moving on to some more statistics regarding a herniated disc done by Jordan and colleagues. Um, so what they found was that there's a male to female ratio of two to one. So more males, uh, or seem to experience a herniated lumbar disc as opposed to females. And that could just be due to the mindset that we have in today's society where males are seen as more as a protector, the stronger ones, and females may be seen as weak. So males uh, may be, be put on harder jobs, tougher jobs as opposed to females. And this can kind of create that um, issue where males may be more susceptible to stress. Or so maybe it just may be that mindset where a lot of males have that kind of maybe meathead mentality when they're in the gym. So they're always looking to lift somebody or outperform somebody on some sort of lift. And then, you know, they're performing maybe bad form on a deadlift and then, you know, a herniated disc may occur. They also found that people aged 22 to 55 years old, about 95% of herniated discs occurred in the lumbar spine. So that was at the L4 and L5 and L5 S1 level. So most herniated discs occur within that region and in that area. So we'll talk about some factors affecting uh, lower back injuries. We talk about posture. So are they engaging in good posture, bad posture? Are they rounding the back, forward head posture? And this could all have important implications when it comes to uh, lower back injury. We got the load. How heavy is the load? How light is the load? The demand capacity relationship is, is, the, is the demand exceeding the capacity. So if the demand exceeds the capacity that the individual could handle, then you know it's only a matter of time until an injury occurs unless it hasn't occurred yet. Or, 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 sorry, or it already has occurred. We've got genetics. Uh, you know, people have different spines uh, in terms of the, you can look at the ligaments, the structure of their spine, uh, the muscles, muscle fibers, tendons, um, and even the physiology is different. So some people more may be more susceptible to disc injuries, whereas others may not be. They have better genetics, and you know they may not be as susceptible. So therefore, they perform maybe more repetitions or more more load or more weight. Let's look at the number of repetitions that they're performing. Are they performing a high number, low number? The duration, how long are they working for? Eight hours, four hours, how long are they sitting for? Four hours, two hours, whatever it may be. Rest, are they engaging in adequate rest? You know, are they sleeping? You know, are they getting adequate sleep? Are they, um, you know, not, not performing? How long are they performing their workload for? Whatever it may be. Diet, what's their diet like? Are they eating a healthy diet or, or an unhealthy diet? Because if they're eating an unhealthy diet, then their whole body's physiology may be um, out of whack and if as opposed to if someone has a good healthy diet you know it might be good pro anti-inflammatory and you know they have a better overall makeup in their body they're putting themselves in a better position to engage in recovery and performance if you look at work physiology what's the metabolic demands if they have to move around a lot what's their heart rate like look at atmospheric conditions if they work in a warm or cold environment look at height weight Taller person may have to go through a larger range of motion as opposed to a shorter person. Is the person obese, overweight, are they underweight, whatever it may be. These are all factors that we need to consider, and they all may affect lower back injuries. So Nakasman, um, 
So getting into some research now. So Nakamson did some uh, research, um, actually did a lot of research on disc pressure measurements in different postural positions. So he looked at the L3, L4 level, and what he found was that in the supine position laying down, it was the least amount of uh, pressure onto this disc level. Side lying, uh, there, you know, there was an increase, and then you could look at relaxed standing, um, increase as well. Forward bending with the spine, uh, with the spine uh, rounded, you know, there was also an increase. And then holding a um, 10 kilogram weight, which is equivalent to about uh, 22 pounds, there is about a 220% uh, amount of pressure onto that disc level, and then you can see it's sitting. It's at 140%, and then you could look at that compared to standing and lying on the ground. So sitting, you're already putting yourself at a, a significant amount of intradiscal pressure on that L3, L4 level. And then you could look at sitting with the back rounded, and then sitting with the back rounded with holding a 10 kilogram rate produced the most amount of pressure, the pressure onto the L3, L4 level. Now keep in mind, all the discs are going to be susceptible to different pressure. This is just the L3, L4 level. And if you go back to the research that I previously mentioned where 95% of disc herniations occur in the lumbar region, and looked at specific, and they were most specifically the L4, L5, and L5, S1 level. So with this, the L3, L4, um, you can kind of take into consider the L4 and L5 and L5 S1 are um, in some cases maybe the most susceptible to um, stress in some cases. Now, Wilkes and his colleagues uh, conducted a study similar to Nakisman's, and they looked at one healthy participant with no degeneration or dehydration. He was 45 years old, 154 pounds, 5'5", five five, measured the L4, L5 disc. So they measured a number of different positions, which is similar to Nakisman, uh, sitting and standing. So they found that disc pressure was greatest when the individual had a rounded back and was holding a 20 kilogram pound weight. So that's the equivalent to about 44 pounds. The, this is different from Nakisman because they used 10 kilograms. He used 10 kilograms, however, uh, Nakisman measured the L3, L4 level, which is also different than the L4, L5 level. Keep in mind, Wilkes only looked at one participant, so there's a lot of limitations here. So regardless, though, they found that leaning forward, whether that was in a sitting or standing position increase the intradiscal pressure. So anytime you're engaging that forward flexion, whether it's sitting or standing, there's an increase in intradiscal pressure. However, Wilkes also found that relaxed sitting, so this was leaning back in a chair, uh, produced a uh, low intradiscal pressure, a lower intradiscal pressure, as opposed to sitting in a neutral position and sitting with the back rounded. So this could have important implications for anyone that may be suffering from a disc loss or herniation, and they have symptoms of sciatica when they're sitting or any sort of nerve pain when they're sitting, it might be best to kind of recline your chair and uh, lean back as opposed to sitting in that kind of more neutral or rounded position, especially if you're sitting for a long period of time. So key takeaway, key point is that forward flexion, whether you're in a standing or a sitting position, increases the pressure on the discs. So forward flexion also combined with rotation actually will increase the disc pressure substantially. This is shown by research done by Dr. McGill and a lot of other research as well, which is important to know. So now we're going to talk about exercises to avoid. So we're going to do some specific exercises to avoid. And uh, these are exercises that I highly recommend avoiding, especially if you have a disc bulge or herniation already. Even if you don't uh, have a disc bulge or herniation, you probably still would want to avoid these exercises. So we'll begin with the sit-up and the crunch. So as you can see uh, in these two photos, we have a sit-up here and we have a, a machine uh, kind of crunch here. So I think this is actually one of the worst kind of machines in the gym that you'll see in terms, because it's one of the uh, machines that puts your spine in a very jeopardized position. As you can see, all this flexion is occurring in my spine. As you can see, all this flexion is occurring. I'm rounding my back, and at the same time, you could load this machine up with weight. So people, you often see in a commercial gym, if you see this machine, put 45 pounds or 90 pounds on, and they'll start performing uh, a number of repetitions of crunches. Now this isn't practical or ideal because if you do this over time, you're creating that bulging herniation mechanism, putting a lot of pressure onto those intra onto those discs. It's only a matter of time until a bulge or herniation may occur. Same goes for a setup here. So you have a setup here. You have the whole background, and this is just a poor postural position. Spine's in a very poor position. A lot of stress is already placed onto the spine. Same time, you know, you're seated, placing more pressure onto that lower spine. People will often, you know, hold a medicine ball, hold some sort of weight or they may engage in some sort of, um, they'll engage in that spinal flexion, they may do some sort of rotational movement as well, which is going to place even more stress. It's not practical, it's not ideal, and it's something, if you have a posterior disc bulge, you want to avoid at all times, because this is only going to, this is a mechanism that creates that injury, and this is something that you would want to avoid. Even if it's just, uh, you're looking to maintain a healthy spine, 
you want to avoid these at all costs. Now, I mean, at the same time, if you, if you want to get, you know, people, the primary reason why people perform this is because they want to get six packs and they want to get those nice abs or whatnot. And so we look at mainstream media, you know, we become obsessive with the image of having a six pack and whatnot. So people will come to the gym and think, you know, maybe perform a thousand sit-ups, a thousand crunches, weighted crunches with the thought of them, you know, eventually getting a setup. And they'll do this almost every day, three times a week, five times a week. And they don't even realize the amount of pressure and stress they're putting on their spine and the amount of damage they're doing, which is very problematic, especially with uh, today's society and kind of the mainstream media. So moving on, we'll look at the leg press now. Leg press I'm not really a fan of just because of it being uh, seated position. You're pushing weight in a seated position. It's not practical. It's not something you do in any sort of activity in, uh, or any sort of sport. You look at hockey, basketball, soccer, football, um, baseball. You know, you're never in this position pushing weight. It's just not functional. It's not practical. And, you know, just by being in a seated position, you're already putting stress onto your lower back. So you have you have that sitting plus, you know, people load up on this. They put sometimes 600, 700 pounds, 1,000, or even 1,000 pounds. And they're putting a significant amount of compression onto the spine. But the biggest problem with this is the butt wink that you may see or the, the kind of the rounding of the pelvis. So people will get into this position without even knowing their pelvis is rounded. It's so their back isn't up against the pad, rather that their pelvis is rounded. And so when they lower the weight down to their chest, what ends up happening is they put a significant amount of load and stress onto those discs, and you're creating that herniation kind of mechanism occurring. And it's not very problematic to begin with. And it's, sorry, it's very pro and sorry, it's it's very problematic to begin with, and it's not ideal. And this is an exercise that you want to avoid. I did a video on this before, which I'll kind of post a link in the description of why you should consider avoiding, especially if you have lower back pain. Same time, you know, there's better exercises exercises out there that um, strengthen the lower body, but also spare the spine. Like, for example, a squat would be one of them, or you could look at a lunge or something like that. So moving on, we can look at seated exercises now. Seated exercises, I talk, uh, you know, if you look back to Nakisman's research, just the compression compared to standing or being in a supine position, laying down, is um, it's much greater in the seated position, which isn't very practical. So it isn't practical to do seated exercises to begin with when you're in that position. So here I just have a picture of me on a, on a stationary bike, and this exercise or you know this type of cardio can become problematic because what you see is the lower back. My lower back is slightly rounded here. The upper back's not in a bad position, but what ends up happening is people do high intervals, you know, they're pedaling very fast, do a lot of resistance, and they get tired, they start bending over and start rounding their backs, and then they will sustain this position for a long period of time. You know, just if you look at any cyclist, a professional cyclist, they're always in that rounded back position. Then you see a lot of these cyclists will have lower back problems just because they're always in that sustained position. So, in my opinion, you know, if you're someone that uh, does have back problems, if you have a disc issue or whatnot, you're going to want to avoid seated exercises because of the amount of more pressure that's going to put on uh, that kind of lumbar region uh, of the discs and whatnot. At the same time, if you're performing any sort of seated exercise, you know, you, you sometimes you might load up more as well, uh, whether that's maybe like a seated shoulder press um, or some sort of seated row, and it's not really practical because, you know, you're combining that heavy load with the sitting, and you get these high compression force, which isn't very practical. So to spare the spine the best way, you want to perform exercise in a prone or supine position or even a standing position. A standing position is very much more functional as well. Also, the seated exercises also, you can get the hip flexors tightened up. They become short. If they become short, you know, you can get a lot of stress placed on, the, placed on that lumbar region, which is impractical. So if you think of it this way, if you're someone that works maybe an eight-hour job and you're sitting all day, it's not very functional and not very practical to go to the gym and do more seated exercises because now you're just contributing to that hip flexor issue. So in my opinion, you know, it's best to just avoid seated exercise. Now I have an abstract there and there's the reason why, because there is an exception and specifically if someone may have some sort of restriction, whether they have an ankle injury, knee injury, seated exercise may be practical in that case then, or if maybe you have a disc bulge in their neck or something, you know, standing, whatever bothers them. So there is some instances and exceptions, but, uh, just something just to keep in mind though. So weighted lateral bends. This is an exercise you commonly see people perform in a commercial gym to strengthen the oblique muscles. It's not very practical. I, I don't know why people perform it because what they're doing is they're taking a weight and they're uh, going through a whole um, cycle of lateral flexion. And just by doing this, they're going to be creating a bulge. So as you can see, the weight's pulling me down here. 
And as you see, I'm creating this bulge mechanism here that's going to shoot this way. It's not practical because now you're placing a lot of stress combined with the weight onto the discs, and they can bulge in a lateral direction. So a better alternative would be a suitcase carry. So in a suitcase carry, what you have is the weight at your side, but instead of letting the weight pull you down, you're stabilizing, maintaining a neutral spine. You're working on your obliques to stabilize you, your quadratus lumborum. Those muscles are all working to stabilize you. And then it's more functional because now you're walking, holding the weight, and you're preventing that kind of lateral flexion occurring. So you're working on the stabilizers and core. Much more functional exercises, and it's much more better as opposed to these, uh, as opposed to these lateral bends. So overall, if you're someone that does have a disc bulge, um, a posterior disc bulge, you're going to want to avoid any flexion-based exercises. So as you can see, the sit-ups, you can see the, um, the crunch machine here, uh, you can see the, the leg press with that kind of rounding of the pelvis. You can also see the lateral flexion occurring in this position right here. So if you have a lateral bulge, you're going to want to avoid this. Um, also, even sit sitting, so seated type of exercise, as you can see, these three types of exercises are all seated. Sitting might exaggerate symptoms, which you want to avoid just because the intradiscal pressure as shown by Naxman is much greater as opposed to standing or being in a supine or prone position. It's not very practical because it may put more pressure onto that disc and cause it to further bulge or further cause pain. So there's something I haven't talked about, which is an interior bulge. And that's uh, we, and I'm not something I'm really going to talk about because it's more so it happens in rare cases, but you will want to avoid extension-based movements or exercise. Flexion plus rotation would put the most pressure on the disc, which you want to avoid at all times as well. So we're going to move on to some high-risk or dangerous exercises, which are exercises that are commonly performed with bad form and often with a heavy load and are very problematic to a lot of people. So we'll begin with the deadlift. So the deadlift is probably, the, probably one of the most common, if not the most common, exercise that people may uh, injure themselves on in terms of suffering a herniated disc or a bulging disc. I know a lot of, uh, I've talked to a lot of people, specifically my subscribers, and they've told me that the deadlift is the reason why, you know, they start experiencing symptoms and the reason why they, you know, suffered a herniated or bulging disc. So what you often see is people will round their back completely. So as you can see, right in this lower spine here, my back is rounded. And so people will literally pull the weight in this position with their back rounded. And, you know, I was guilty of this a couple of years ago when I did it, when I had probably about three plates on the bar, and that's what happened. Uh, and I, you know, I started experiencing sciatica, a bulging disc. Now, um, the problem is, is that when you're rounding your back like that, there's just a significant amount of pressure, and you combine that with, you know, whatever it is, 300 pounds on the bar, you know, there's like a 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 percent increase onto the disc pressure. And it's literally only, a few, you know, it would only probably take a few repetitions for some people to really... Um, herniate or bulge a disc and you know consider me six foot five I'm taking that bar through a, a large range of motion so this exercise has really ended a lot of people's careers and um, you know made people's lives difficult so it's important that when you're setting off for the deadlift though you're maintaining a good neutral spine so as you see in the second photo here spines in a good straight neutral position we're minimizing amount of pressure on the discs because then we're taking ourselves out of flexion or putting ourselves in the neutral which is going to reduce uh, the risk of uh, a disc injury occurring we're in an optimal position here to perform the exercise it's a much more it's obviously much more safer position as opposed to this and this is what you see many people do in the commercial gym also the deadlift itself it's a great exercise now you know aside from the fact that you know I got myself injured from it, a lot of people also got injured themselves it's a great exercise um, for developing the posterior chain, um, you know, working on that hip hinge and developing whatever, maybe grip strength and all sorts of other things. Just a great exercise developing power. But just the problem is, is that a lot of people tend to load up, have bad form, and a lot of things can go wrong with this exercise. So therefore, it's really important, really important to kind of get your form down and get your technique down before you really load up. And also, you can kind of compare the trap bar versus barbell deadlift. So Trap bar may be a little bit uh, safer to just to perform in terms of uh, the back just because you're taking um, your hands out of uh, that, that kind of rotated position. You're putting them into more neutral in the trap bar and the weight is centered as opposed to being in front of the body. So there's a less chance of rounding occurring in the back as opposed to the barbell. Now I did a video on that before so I'll post a link in the description below if you want to check that out or I go into more detail about that. So now we're going to move on to the squat. So the squat is another great exercise. It's like the deadlift, great for strengthening the lower body. But however, 
it can be a very dangerous exercise as well if it's performed uh, with bad form or technique. And so the biggest, one of the biggest issues is you with the squat is you that you may see is the bowing. So here's a video of me from a couple years ago when I was just kind of getting back to squatting and performing a front squat, and I had a friend just videotape me uh, and just look at my squat depth because I wanted to see where the butt wink was occurring so I could correct it. So as you can see as I get lower, the butt wink's occurring here so you have this rounding of the pelvis occurring. So now you, if you go back to the leg press video that I, sh or sorry, the leg press photo, this is the similar a similar case that's occurring here. So you have that rounding of the pelvis, it's, spot, it's flexed to the lower back here and then if you combine that with you know a significant load you can put a lot of stress onto the discs here and ultimately if you do this over time especially with a significant load a ball alternation may occur not something you want not something that's a deal something you want to avoid and look out for at all times you know if you go in a gym you see a lot of people perform the squat and they'll you know they'll go ask the grass or have they'll have that mentality of going to ask the grass or just getting their butt all the way down just because it's what a lot of people tell them in society they got to do specifically the mainstream media and it's not something that you want to listen to because if you're going to do that over time you're just going to injure yourself so that's, so that's a problem kind of with our society we have this mentality where you know you got to go all the way down and whatnot and it's not ideal it's not something that's proper not everyone can do that and so reasons for this butt wink that may occur could be due to tight hamstrings which is one reason that's been suggested another reason it could be due to the genetics, um, just kind of the hip anatomy, the, the anatomy of your hip. When you look at the acetabulum, kind of the, the structure of your femur and the hip socket, a lot of people's like their everyone's hips are developed differently. So some people's hips allow them to squat deep, whereas others don't, and so you get that butt wink occurring. For instance, in my case, so if you're someone that does do this, what you want to do to avoid this is just squat to the point where it doesn't occur. Which well, I'll go back for a second. Is that the point where you're about probably 90 degrees right there? So this would probably be a good position for me in my case to go down. So about 90 degrees, you know, I don't have that bow wink. I have a good neutral position here and I don't have that flexion occurring. So I'm avoiding that. So that's just something to look out for, guys. Look out for that bow wink. Avoid it. Um, and if you know, if you are doing, if you're, if you aren't aware of it, just have someone videotape you and, and you could kind of correct it yourself. So you could also have the front squat versus back squat consideration. So front squat, you know, the load's on front, you have more quad focus. Back squat, more erector focus, a little bit more compression on the spine, on the lower spine specifically. So that's something that you maybe consider if you want to kind of reduce the uh, compression on your spine, looking to kind of minimize, if you want to squat and want to minimize the compression on the lower back, front squat might be more optimal. Moving on to the seated row. So the seated row, to begin, I'm not really a fan of this exercise because it's not very functional because you're in a seated position. If you go back to Nakisman's research, he looked at how being in a seated position, more uh, disc, uh, more pressure on the discs. So with this exercise, you go into a commercial gym, you see a lot of people will perform it uh, improper, and you'll see a lot of rounding of the spinal cream when they pull the weight towards their chest. And this is, you know, you're creating that mechanism for a herniation or bulge to occur because you're putting more pressure on the discs by being in that flexed position. So it's important to keep a neutral spine as you see in the second photo. You have a good straight neutral alignment here. We don't have that rounding occurring like we do here. So this is going to minimize the amount of pressure and at the same time we're reducing the risk for an injury occurring. So a seated row, some benefits of it, you know, it's good for loading up the upper and middle back. If you're looking to kind of build some muscle on the upper and, upper and middle back, you know, it may also be practical for someone with a knee or ankle injury where they can't stand or something. However, in my case, you know, I, I prefer something like a standing row or TRX row as opposed to something that's seated like this that's not very functional because consider any sort of – the only sport, you know, you could really think of is – that I could think of at the top of my head would be rowing, which would be good – maybe this would be a good exercise for. But think of like hockey, basketball, soccer, football, baseball, five kind of major sports. You're never in this position where you're seated and rowing. So moving on now to the preacher curl. So the preacher curl is commonly performed by bodybuilders or general population, and it has actually ended careers. And so the reason being is what you'll see. So first of all, this preacher curl, it's not really optimal just because uh, it's not adjustable. And for me being 6'5", um, you know, I got to kind of get into a less optimal position. But to begin, as you see, my arms are kind of rested, my triceps are rested against the pad. My elbow here is in hyperextension, which isn't practicable, which I'll talk about in a second, but... I have a little bit of rounding in the lower back, so I don't have a good position in the spine. 
But where you see many problems occurring is in the upper thoracic and kind of upper neck region, which is where the rounding will normally occur. Now, you could also change the body alignment and put myself in a seated position, which may lead to people or uh, being able to load up more because now you're taking the legs out of it, but you're putting more compression on that spine, which is impractical as well. So as we see in the second photo now, I'm changing where my elbow placement is. By changing my elbow placement, I'm putting my elbow in a better position. You see my spine's in a good neutral position as well, and we're not um, in any sort of flexion in the lower back here. And then we look at the third photo. So now as we lower the weight down, the elbow, the forearms can rest against the floor, uh, against the, um, the pad here, and they prevent the elbow from going to hyperextension because as the elbow comes to the end of the pad here, the forearms don't prevent uh, the elbow from going to hyperextension. They're allowing the elbow to go into hyperextension when you have this load, a lot of stress under the joint. So it's important with this pre with the preacher curl, you know, keeping an upright neutral position. And if you're going to perform it seated, keep it upright neutral position. Avoid rounding of the upper back and neck. And if you go into a gym, if you just look out, watch people perform the preacher curl. You often see people performing very heavy weight, elbows extended out in hyperextension. You'll see rounding the upper back and neck. And it's just if they keep performing this over time. You know, problems are going to occur, uh, and a bulge or herniation will occur. So it's not, and it has ended careers for bodybuilders, and uh, and has affected people's lives as well, who have been injured from that. So now when we look at the bent over row, so we have the bent over row, so we can look at dumbbell versus barbell. So we'll talk about the dumbbell row first. Firstly, this is an exercise that I see that's commonly performed in bad form in the gym. I'm not a fan of it either at the same time, because you see all this, you see, if you see in this picture, I have rounding in my lower back, upper back, and I have a forward head posture, okay? So people tend to perform this exercise with way too much weight, and the, you'll see a lot of rounding occurring in the back, and it's just really, it's putting a lot of stress onto the onto the discs, it's not practical, and you know, you're kind of creating that mechanism for a bulge or herniation occur. So, as you see in the second photo here, we have better uh, form here, we have good technique, you know, a good neutral spine, in the lower back all the way to head, we don't have the forward head posture, the lower back, upper back, it's not rounded. It's in a good neutral position. So it's it's it, this is the position that's optimal if you're going to perform the dumbbell row. And just be careful not to go too heavy because people will start jerking away and they'll start rounding their backs. And it's just not ideal because they're putting so much stress onto their discs. And it's just a matter of time until a herniation or bulge may occur. So move on to the barbell row. So I'm not a fan of this exercise at all. And I'll tell you why. It's because you're getting into a bent over position to begin with. So that's the first reason why. So by getting into a bent over position to begin with and performing the row, it's not ideal and it's not practical because so many things could go wrong with the spine, especially if you break form. If you start rounding your back at any point, especially when you carry this load and you're in that bent position, there's a lot of stress that's going to be placed onto the, the lower discs here. And so as you can see in these photos, my spine is slightly rounded here. This isn't an optimal position to begin with. Now I have this red line here. And the reason why I have this red line here is now, it's not that my, my spine is in a bad position here. It's actually in a, a really good position. But what you'll see is with most people in the gym is they're, they'll gauge in forward head posture and their upper back, upper back will round as they start lifting really heavy weight or if, they, you know, if they're pulling the weight really quickly. Problem is you start loading up with this exercise, you know, especially if you have bad form. You know, it's only a matter of time until an injury is going to occur. And um, at the same time, I'm just not a fan because so many things could go wrong with this exercise form can be broken at any point and it's not practical so moving on so some alternatives i want to talk about to the seated row and bent over row, bent over rows so whether it's dumbbell or barbell so we have a standing cable row here we have a standing uh upper more of a kind of an upper mid row where we're in a more upright position um it's a more of a high cable row and we have a trx row right here which it's just these exercises, in my opinion, they're a lot better alternatives to the seated row and to the bent over rows because, first of all, if you look at the two standing rows, they're more functional because you're in a standing position as opposed to a bent over position, more applicable to other situations. Same time, the TRX row, you know, you could change the different angles uh, that you're working at. And so if you go back to Nakisman study, if you get into a supine position, you know, it's the lowest amount of disc pressure. So you're performing, you're spamming the spine while you're in that position, but you could also load up on this by using a weighted vest or whatever it may be. So in my opinion, these are much better alternatives because you're still getting similar muscle activation, still building up that upper back, middle back improving posture. But, you know, you're minimizing the, um, the amount of pressure placed on the spine. 
as well as you're still getting those benefits uh, in terms of strengthening the upper and middle back. Uh, so those are just my opinions, guys, and and those are some alternatives that you may want to consider if you're someone that maybe performs bent over rows, dumbbell rows, or seated rows because they're just not very functional, and, and these exercises are more functional and just more so they, they spare the spine uh, better than the other those other exercises. So guys, uh, that's kind of it for my little online lecture presentation. Um, so the kind of key points to take away is that if you suffer from a posterior disc bulge, you want to avoid flexion-based movements. If you suffer from a lateral disc bulge, you want to avoid the lateral-based movements. Um, and if you're someone that maybe has an anterior disc bulge, then you want to avoid extension-based movements. And also it's important to understand that sitting may make symptoms worse. Sitting is not functional to begin with. Uh, because, you know, we do this all day, you know, it, when looking at an accident study, it puts the most amount of stress uh, as compared to being in a, a standing or prone or supine position. So by already putting yourself in that position, you may exaggerate symptoms and you start, if you start loading up, it's not really practical. At the same time, it doesn't, it's not very functional applicable to other sorts of sports or activities. So also when it comes to the high risk or dangerous exercises, like, you know, the deadlift and squat I talked about, you know, it's important that you master your form first or you have near perfect form when you're performing those types of exercises. And I would suggest if, you're, if your pain symptoms are, are high or moderate to avoid those exercises uh, until they have come down and you've made a recovery because it's just not, it would not be ideal for you to go perform those exercises. Same because, because you could, there's so much problematic things that can occur. It's better to uh, just avoid those until you're maybe near the end of your recovery. You're kind of getting back into things and you shouldn't, at the same time, you shouldn't um, jump right back into things. You want to slowly start with a lot of regressions and then progress. Also, you know, if you're unsure about your form or technique, you know, it's, I would suggest hiring an expert coach or trainer to show you proper form and technique, maybe just for like an hour session, hire them and uh, have them evaluate your squat, your deadlift and tell them and they, they'll make suggestions on what to clean up and what the strength in if something's weak because there's no need to you know go up on perform a deadlift or squat there's no need to destroy your life or back so that's just kind of my tips to you guys so um you know so like i said avoid those flexion based movements either the posterior disc bulge um, avoid those high compression forces avoid sitting and you know avoid those in my opinion i would you know the cedar row bent over rows i would probably avoid those and stick to the more safer alternatives like the trx row the standing cable rows, just, they're, they're just much more optional, uh, optimal and spine sparing. You're still getting those same benefits. So guys, that's just kind of it for this online little lecture and presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, be sure to leave them below as I'll, you know, I'll be happy to answer them. And uh, if, you know, also be sure to sh share your story. Uh, if you're someone that does have a disc bulge or some sort of disc injury and, you know, it, it was caused by one of these exercises or, or any sort of kind of related kind of flexion based movement or whatever it may be be sure to leave that story below as i'd love to kind of just hear about it and if, also if you want if you uh, want to see more videos like this where i'm kind of doing this little online lecture and whatever and if you enjoyed this be sure to give this video a thumbs up and uh also be sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already okay guys i wish you guys all the best and a successful and productive day take care